Okay. Um, hi, David. Hi, Sophia. Really great to hear from you. Uh, I know this week is different. I mean, in, it's different from last week in the sense that the lectures, the Harvard lectures we watched are very different from anything we've talked about. It's mostly focused on political philosophy. So uh, let me just start with the first video lecture, which talks about uh, libertarianism. So libertarianism or libertarian, it, the, the libertarian party actually is a political party within the US. You can vote like they got 2% of the presidential vote. They ran a candidate, like you could vote for the libertarian candidate. Uh, libertarianism is this position that the government is uh, illegitimate except for a tiny, tiny minority of things. It can provide for a police force. It can tax people for to, to fund a police force, a legal system, and a military to keep anyone from invading us. Everything beyond that is illegitimate and wrong to tax and take people's money away for. When I teach this material at John Hopkins Center for Talented Youth, where I teach philosophy to 11-year-olds, I have them list all of the things that they wish government could do that would be good to do. And then I, and then I split them up. I'm like, all right, well, we need to fund all of these great things. I mean, they make this list like NASA, uh, helping the poor, fixing the environment, giving free education, right? We make a list of all the great things we could do with government. And then I say, oh, great, well, we don't have enough money for that. So who is team, let's get guns and go down to the, the town and just take the money we need to fund all this stuff. And who is, let's not grab guns and go take that money to fund all those things. And it, they split it. But that's the libertarian position. The libertarian position is you are grabbing guns and you are sending people who are threatening to throw folks in jail at the at gunpoint to be able to fund. I mean, the, the libertarian is not saying that these aren't great things that we could do with government. The problem is that it requires the stealing of money in this sort of utilitarian way in order to do it at gunpoint to be able to threaten people with, with jail in order to get the money to do all these great things. And just one last thing before I let you guys talk. So Robert Nozick of who we've talked about before with the experience machine, he makes the classic argument in favor of libertarianism in a book called Anarchy, the State and Utopia in 1974, where he says, listen, when we think about what makes a distribution of wealth in a society fair or morally legitimate, it's wrong to think that we need to look at, well, all like a small minority has all the wealth and a small, like, and a bunch of people don't have, like that's the wrong way to think about it. It's, we shouldn't look at how things are currently distributed. We should look at how it got that way. To care about a fair moral distribution is to care about whether the distribution was people trading of free choice of going out to land and um, you know making that land to productive, uh, what do I say here? Productive land for society. I mean, the idea here is if you look at the history of how the distribution got so imbalanced, there's no, if there is no stealing, no coercion, no forced grabbing of money, then the distribution is fair, even if the end result is wildly imbalanced. And the, the, the end result, we shouldn't look at the end result and how things are distributed and say, well, that's a bad distribution. We should look at the history of how that distribution came to be. And as long as it's always through free choice and no one coercing anybody, um, then we have to just live with that dis distribution as a fair distribution and government doesn't have the right to come in and take away money that came from a fair distribution and redistribute it to poor people just because we don't like the way that free choice has led money to be distributed. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the I libertarian that, position, go ahead. I think that's a bit um, like naive to say that like the distribution got to where it is only by like free choices. Uh, we can all agree that like you have to, you know, do some kind of work 
right? I mean, if we, everyone wants to have money and mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Um, so you have to be productive in some way, um, which means that there's like, there's no choice. You have to work, right? And most people aren't just going to like work by themselves on a farm, right? Most people work in a society where you're working with other laborers and you have, you're working with capital that's been provided by investors um, and so on. And so you're working in this system. And when you do, you're working and uh, you create a certain amount of profit for the company when you work. Um, and then um, your boss takes that like labor value and gives you money. Um, and there's no company in the world that would pay you um, the actual amount that you earned for the company. They're going to pay you less than what you earned because that's how they get profit. Um, and so the libertarian would say, well, you made like a, a fair agreement. And so it's fine for this stealing to happen. But I just think it's silly to think that like taxes, which are typically much smaller than the amount of money that's been squeezed out of you through this surplus labor value. I don't see why I should care about taxes when I feel like yeah. my okay. employer is really stealing money. So the exploitation of the worker is a larger injustice than like the small amount that's taken out by taxes is what you're saying. Yeah. And I feel like it's coerced either way because both I have to, if I'm working and I have to work in order to eat, then both I'm being squeezed both ways. And at least the money that the government is taking is hopefully going to something good. Right. But the money that my employer is taking is just going to profits for investors. Great. I mean, I think I think the libertarians argument is at the end of the day, Google or any sort of job can't send police with guns to throw you in jail for not paying. Like the like there is there is a special wrong in the government taking money and charging you because because Google ultimately can't uh, or any sort of company can't take your money without you willingly engaging with them, willingly working for them. So I I, I think that you are hitting exactly one of the smart places to push the libertarian to say, is it any less free or any more free to live in a world where monopolies are forcing us to work for them to live and like that companies are enslaving me, you know, that then, then having the government do it. The, the libertarian wants to say that the government is especially different because they can f- they have the they have the power of a police force and jails and guns to force you to pay them to do what they want to do and that's a violation of your liberty in a way that businesses can't violate your liberties and so that makes their you know use of you or you, I mean you can feel exactly as unfree under corporations as you can feel under government, but the libertarians can say, but government is is different because they actually do have uh, a police force, a jail and a military who will, you know, come with people with guns to put you in jail if you don't pay them. And that's like the special difference. Yeah, I think another difference is that the libertarian isn't saying you have to work for someone. They're perfectly okay with you uh, just making minimum wage or being homeless, they have no opposition to that choice of yours. Like, I think a big thing is, say two people are both lucky enough to go to college and they major in different things, which they're both passionate in, and both those fields have different earning potentials. And they would say that it would be reasonable for them to make two different incomes. And if anything, it would be unjust for you to force them to have an equal outcome is one thing, but. David, I really want to hear your reply here. All right. My reply is I feel like um, there's just kind of being this arbitrary choice where we we say that like, well, your employer, right? You're Mm -hmm. making them the money and then they steal your, they're stealing it in a more indirect way. Whereas the government is taking it in like a more direct way. And, but like, I don't, I don't really see a difference. Like, I guess just like looking at like the end consequence, right? You don't really have the choice to not work, right? You can say, well, yeah, libertarian right, is fine right, with right, right. starving. Well, so, but I'm not fine with me starving, right? 
Um, clearly, well, I have why to can't work. you found your own business? Like, why can't you be the boss? There's nothing that says you can't do that. Yes, it's more work and it's more time consuming and it does take more effort, but then you'll be able to reap all the profits. So you can do that if you have that big of an issue with corporations. Well, but first, but I mean, most, the vast majority of people don't get that to do that, right? I mean, we can't have everyone be the boss unless you want to move to a system that's very much not libertarianism. Um, which I mean, would they could. Well, I think, I, mean, I think David's point is correct that, that people are born into these nepotistic systems where, you know, who your dad is depend, like that enables you to have all sorts of advantages in starting your own company, which you won't have if you're poor. You have a, a bunch of education advantages that you won't have if you're poor. So the, the idea that, uh, well, why don't you, I mean, why won't you just start your own company? The, the worry here is that I think maybe that even breaking free of any sort of uh, corporate um, system, which is controlling you is very difficult to do if you don't have the, ha like the helping hand of government to raise people up to some sort of minimum. I mean, even our education system, K through 12 education is funded by government money, which is taken by taxes, which the libertarian would get rid of so then you have these educated children of rich people and the illiterate children of poor people. How are these illiterate children of poor people supposed to get like get a, get any sort of grip on making their own way in a really fully libertarian country? Mm -hmm. Can I uh, add one more thing? Go which for is it. That like um, when we you know why not make your own company? Um, if you're making your own company, you can either exploit other people, right? You can take their surplus value. Um, but then, so the point is still like, you know, some people have to have their surplus value taken because not everybody can be the CEO. Or you can try to say, well, I'm not going to take people's surplus value. Um, I'm going to make one that fairly distributes profits. But then you have the problem of where do you get investment from? Because shareholders aren't going to invest in your company. Um, if you don't give them money back for investing in your company. Um, I, I mean, your point is that, that the sort of profit motive of sh the, the shareholder investment uh, rewards immoral exploitation over a selfless, like that the whole system tends towards m making people to succeed at business tends to be people and companies who are cutthroat assholes who exploit people. And then you have- yeah, the whole the... capitalist system of creating companies and how that works exploits people just intrinsically. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's just no way that like a system that like doesn't involve a large amount of government intervention um, could like topple this like way of everyone exploiting everyone else all the time. Um, but still, I'm, I really am just arguing on utilitarian grounds. Uh, like no matter how I try to push it, uh, like my just intense revulsion to libertarianism ultimately falls on just like how incredibly awful of a world I think a libertarian world would be to live in. The, the, I mean, the libertarian, I mean, so, so, I mean, actually, let me just go on a rant about libertarians. So they, they often, so normal libertarians, like the people you meet in the world who are libertarians, they often don't understand their own kind of position. But so some of them want to say something like, listen, everybody with a selfish motive, if everybody like if we had a libertarian world, it would be a utopia where people worked hard and the best companies would rise and win and bad companies would fall and this would make us better off. I think that that's false. I don't like, I think, I mean, so David, you're saying that that's also false. Like that's a, if libertarianism was true, it would be terrible. The other argument for libertarianism is this strong Kantian argument that going to somebody's house and taking their freely earned money from other people who freely paid them to do some work and say, well, we get to take some of it because other people are in need, despite you, like, despite you not owing anything to them uh, at gunpoint is just robbery. Like 
it's just straight up robbery and the, and, and the only way you could possibly just, so I, I tend to think that a purely libertarian world would be a world with a lot more suffering. I don't think that we would, I don't believe the libertarian claim that we would be doing great. I think it would be miserable. I do kind of buy into the Kantian argument that maybe this is morally required, that it's actually wrong to go around stealing people's money and redistributing it on utilitarian grounds. So the, I mean, there's two arguments for the, the libertarian and I don't think libertarians often separate these out enough because like one is this sort of, well, we'd all be better off if we were libertarian. That's one argument. The other one is the one that I'm more convinced by, which is that's just what's morally, I mean, in order, I mean, he, he conflates taxing people with slavery, right? That I own you enough to take away money you earn from your own labor through your free consent. Like you go work with somebody, somebody else needs work done. They pay you, you freely consent. They give you that money. And then I come along and say, I mean, I know that everybody was trading money freely, but like these other people need that money. I'm just going to come take it at gunpoint. And that seems wrong on Kantian ground, on consent respecting mm -hmm. Kantian grounds. And if you think of it, it's even more like slavery when they talk about how I really appreciated the one girl's point about how you're born into the society and you can't really escape it, which I think, David, you kind of touched on in that you can't escape the company kind of uh, spiral. So in the same sense, we're born into this taxation slavery because we really can't escape it. Like, I think the libertarians have some, they're not completely wrong about the taxation, but I don't think if you applied everything, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't work overall, but they may be right about taxation. I think that um, the argument that Nozick makes um, that um, taxation is slavery is quite questionable, at least like the last step that I, goes from- I, Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> The last step where he goes from like, what's it called? Forced labor equals slavery. Yeah. Um, well, there were the two steps. And then before forced labor, it was like taking the product of someone's labor, right? And I would just like to say that um, taking the product of someone's labor is a bit different than forcing them to labor, right? Like having like a whip and saying like plow the field is different from just like stealing, right? Um, I, I think I think I think you're right that this is more similar to stealing than slavery. And in the same way that I always wonder about Peter Singer's equation of speciesism with racism, and and then here the equation of the Nozick's equation of or uh, of you know taxation with slavery. It's just like treating things with something that we all agree is wrong. Like these like. Uh, what I want to say here, these culturally loaded words like slavery and racism, uh, that always seems like kind of a cheap move on on both of their parts. I, and and I think that there's a probably a pretty big difference between being a slave and being taxed. Uh, I, I, I get Nozick's point, but I also feel like that's kind of a cheap move. Uh-huh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that he could be kind of stretching. But in the same sense, like, I don't think you could conflate it to as much as slavery, but I do think it is a little more severe than robbery. Because like, for example, in certain companies, like with sales, if you don't make your sales quotas, you're done. Or like, and like every year, they basically double your sales quotas. So people have to switch companies every few years because it's just impossible to meet the quotas. Like they're I mean, not I think, bound to the company by li for life and they can switch, which makes it not slavery, but to a certain degree, they don't have as much autonomy as I think we could all agree would be ideal. I think there's a really interesting point that you have to work and make money. If, if there was no government, if we were libertarian and all the government did was a police force, I mean, there was no, there was no social safety net. So there's no food banks. There's no like money for the poor. Well, there would you be charities. To, say again? Well, there would be charities, but it's, Char it wouldn't be the right, same. Right. It wouldn't be the same. But I don't know if that would do enough. I, I think that the, in the libertarian world, I don't know how different it is to be 
enslaved to companies in order to live and provide for your family than it is to be enslaved to the government by being taxed. You know, that, that the rule of, of government at the explicit threat of the police arresting you and throwing you in jail is all that different from a libertarian government where that you're, you're under the implicit threat that you've got to work for one of these companies or you're going to starve to death. It seems the, the way in which in both cases there is the threat of dying kind of in the background kind of makes it equally troubling. I mean, I, 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 I to be honest, I do I do have a, a ton of sympathy for the libertarian arguments. I I I really think that they're pretty strong, and I don't vote. I mean, I, sometimes I do vote for libertarian candidates, but I I don't generally vote for them. But I I do think that they have a good case, except for the fact that I'm not entirely certain that uh, a world where I have to choose between Microsoft or Apple or whatever company that is like much more in control of our lives than they are currently in order to live is a more free world where I'm not being controlled uh, than a world where the government just is taxing me. Yeah, I mean, for example, you have to, you have to pick a university to work for. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, that's true. I mean, I mean, even even the university you, you both are going to is supported, I think, by half by federal, like by do, like gov, like tax federal aid, dollars. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and all your K through 12 education. I don't know what sort of financial background you came from, but uh, a bunch of people who don't have kids were taxed to pay for K through 12 education. And if they didn't pay those taxes, they would go to jail. Do we think that that is a fair system to force people, childless people, to pay for the mm -hmm. education of people who have kids? Oh yeah, one thing about that. Um, my brother is, has like a very severe like dyslexia, and our public school would not be able to help him. Or like maybe he'd pass high school, but he wouldn't really have many options. So. He, has, he goes to the school for dyslexic kids, which thankfully my parents can afford, but my dad made the point like, why do I have to pay taxes for schooling when the schooling doesn't even accommodate my child properly and I have to send them somewhere else? As uh, I mean, I, just as a personal note, I, I, I'm dyslexic as well. And it was kind of a rough, it was a rough yeah. go. My like- Even getting a diagnosis is, was yeah. really difficult. Yeah. I, uh, I remember my like eighth birthday where I had to go get, it was the worst birthday ever. Yeah. I went to, I went and got tested and then I got, I remember, I remember I was crying as the doctor was talking to my parents and giving them the results. And I was sitting by a window and I grabbed the curtain and pulled it around me because I like didn't want to be seen as the doctor was yeah. telling me that I was, I was, uh, it was, it was a rough go. Okay. So let's talk about the next lecture just because I want to keep moving. So the next one is about John Locke and, um, I mean, one of, so as somebody who's been in philosophy for a while, and I've heard people argue against libertarians, one of the most prominent libertarians is here at the University of Maryland. Um, my, Dan, my, Dan yeah, Moeller, Dan he's, got Dan a, he's got a recent book. <laughs> and and one, of the things, famous. Yeah, one of the yeah. things that people argue against him, like, so I, I've watched a lot of grad students argue against him, like, for his libertarianism and, and colleagues argue against him for lib his libertarianism. And one of the points that people like to push is property, you know, there's a lots of rights which are just natural and built into us and you can't violate regardless because that's just built into humankind. But a lot of people wanna say property rights is an invention of society, invention of law. There's no such thing as owning something unless there's a government that, like that is just, so the idea that the government needs to, uh, needs to respect property rights is silly because the idea of property is a complete government invention in the first place. That's one of the, and, and so, we, so John Locke in the second lecture that Sandel gives, he talks about John Locke who says, no, property actually is a natural right just like the other ones we might think exist that it exists separate from government. You own yourself. And when you go and cut down a tree and 
craft it into a bunch of pieces of art or into a well, I mean, you mix your yourself, your labor with the item, right? And you, you till the ground of a farm, you, you dig a well. Once you've mixed your work with this object, that object becomes yours in a way that the, that the government has to respect and can't tax away. So, so John Locke is making the argument that property actually does pre-exist government that property comes into existence when you mix your labor with objects and then those objects become yours. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think one of the objections to libertarianism would be to say that property is merely an invention of law. Uh huh. Yeah. If I could make the objection, like I think that it's somewhat bizarre that we would think that property could ever like be a more important right than the right to life because it seems like you can't have the right to property if you don't have the right to life. Um, and so I, I feel like maybe um, before we're concerned with property rights, we should be concerned with healthcare and so on. Because like, like I said, like if you're dead, you can't have property rights. Um, but- well, I think what it's protecting against is like we hear property, we think land, but like what's to stop someone like stronger who has more guns from just coming and taking all your wealth if you don't have property rights basically like you can't have a functioning society where people respect one another and don't like steal outright and it's just it would be mob rule otherwise if we didn't have property rights well there's a difference also between um private property and personal property um that is like private property being um your ability to like own capital, right? Um, to own means of production, right? And personal property, meaning your toothbrush. Um, and so it's perfectly reasonable to say that in a state of nature, um, you know, maybe you own your toothbrush, right? And so on, and maybe you have this a small like sphere of influence around you, right? If you want to like, kind of a Kantian idea, like if you want to be able to choose how your life is like run, like how the things around you operate, right? Your house and so on, uh, that's your personal property. Uh, but then if you want to go out and say like, this whole forest is mine um, and you start to say, you know, this factory is mine, um, it starts to become more dubious that we should really accept that you can just control like a whole factory uh, and that when people go and put their labor into it, that you own all that they produce. So there what is do you this... think each individual worker owns their own little spot where they work? Like, I don't understand how this would be applied well, the on any on any scale. Well, here's do they the, own the shares in the company? It would be something like, yeah, like in Germany, they have a system where once a company is large enough, 50% of shares in the company have to be owned by workers. Um, okay, so what if my company goes bankrupt? Do I now owe that company since my shares have gone bankrupt? Do not do I now own the investors part of the debt the company's received? Well, I think most companies are limited liability. And so if a company crashes, everybody who's involved doesn't like get personally harmed other than they lose their investment, right? Like I see what you mean, like modern insurance covers. Yeah, you, you, you lose your investment, but you know, if your company has limited liability, you're not going to go in debt if the company fails. Okay, let me Unless let me change like. the subject slightly. So one of the things that he talks about in the John Locke stuff is this idea that you enter the state by consent, right? So there's this common idea in political philosophy that we exist in a state of nature where you can do whatever you want, everybody else can do whatever they want, but that is miserable everyone gets killed very quickly. It's a short, brutish existence that isn't very pleasant. And we would all rather live in a government under the rule. So that by being born in the United States or you know, by staying where you grew up and like benefiting from government uh, handouts and policies and living there, you are consenting so the idea here would be something like that the government isn't enslaving you. It isn't forcing itself on you. You've decided to stay here. So on those grounds, you're bound by the rules of this government. Yeah, Is that only, a adequate justification? My only, I think it's adequate to a certain degree, but at another point, 
at this point in history, all the world is owned by different governments. Like I can say purchase 50 or 100 acres and go live like a hermit in the woods, but I would still technically be on US land and I would still have to pay um, uh, the land, the property tax. Like there's nowhere in the world I can go where the land is just, is not owned by any governments. So I think there's a bit of a flaw in that. Like there is no way to escape it. Could the, could the government make the argument that even if there was a hypothetical land where there was no government, you wouldn't choose to go there? I mean, I'm assuming that that land would be a hellscape of violence. Uh, uh-huh. I think so, it would be more just, I assume it would just be like, you know, those like shows where it's like people who just live in like the middle of Alaska for no reason. And it's just kind of like, oh, they're kind of kooky, but it's what they wanted to do. I would imagine it would be like really arid land that had no use that no one would want. But I would imagine there would be like a couple random people there. They'd probably like outlaws of some sort. David? One thing I think is kind of interesting is how we're like, well, you know, if you accept government handouts and so on, then you have to accept like the rest of the rule. But like from a practical standpoint, right, you can't just say I'm no longer going to accept anything the government does. You know, I'm going to turn down like any social security and so on. And then because I'm not accepting any of that, I no longer have to pay taxes. Right. That's not an option. Um yeah, you can't remove yourself even if you don't use their services. Uh-huh. But I do think, I mean, you could say that like, um, you would net like almost no one would ever actually choose to go back to a state of nature. But that almost feels kind of like Leviathan-y to me, like kind of, it's almost like you're, you're being held at gunpoint to consent to governments, except that it's like, again, it's an indirect gunpoint. Um, nobody is going to actually come and kill you, right? But like, it would be such an awful idea to actually live in a state of nature that you'd be willing to accept almost any form of government. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's a little worrisome to think that the like I have to make a choice between this absolutely crazy bad option and like this guy. I mean, that, that yeah. seems like it would. I mean, Hobbes thought it just sort of supported any government whatsoever, no matter how how brutal, and that doesn't seem like a good criteria for. I mean. Is every government justified because we would basically prefer anything over the state of nature? Uh, I wouldn't say they're justified, but I would say that you're obligated to follow their rules if you live in that country because like you will be thrown in jail and different things. But I, if anything, I think it's actually a positive incentive for us to improve our governments as much as we can and to think of new systems and apply them. Like we wouldn't have like for example the us was basically an experiment of what if we do some better things because we don't want to live in a monarchist system in europe well so, so we the have libertarian this incentive to try the libertarians gonna say the best thing we could do to improve our government is to get elected and greatly reduce everything the government does like any yeah. program we can cut we should cut like because all like everything you reduce out of the government you are starting to eliminate the illegal not not even just illegal sorry not illegal uh, immoral stealing of people's wealth for the greater good in these utilitarian grounds. And you should, I mean, so is, I mean, if I, if I was elected Senator or you were elected Senator, should I try to make government money support people to make them better off? Or should I try just cutting everything, like vote to cut everything I can because government is the stealing of people's money. I mean, I think the best thing to do is you would want to, you would want the government offices that you have in place to be as least corrupt as you can make them. And you would want them to benefit people as much as possible. Like for example, there were huge cuts in the US Department of Agriculture, which resulted in these huge companies like Tyson and Monsanto and all these other companies. Then basically they got a lot more control and they put all these farmers in perpetual cycles of debt because you could control aspects of your company more. So when that funding was cut, you can, it's a clear example of how corruption and unhappiness and misery spread. So I feel like once you put the government systems in place, you can't really take them away. Like you can improve them, but I don't think you can completely get rid of them. Like I mean, once you've founded yeah. public education, you can't really get rid of it because there's nothing to take its place. Yeah, no, I agree that like, it just seems as if um, 
it just seems as if it's kind of naive to just boil it down to like this money is being taken away and I don't have a choice because it just, you know, like we can say, oh, we'll take away the money and then it be, gets, gets taken away from like USDA. And then like the companies come in and like uh, bribe out the USDA. And then all of a sudden, like it fucks over like a million farmers living all throughout the US. Like it's it's just we can't really think about things. I feel in such a simple way and think that we've reached the truth. Um, there's all of these crazy consequences. I mean, let, let's so imagine I, let's I let's imagine for a second that the U.S. government had a policy of kidnapping people, stealing their like finding like unhappy people like in this sort of utilitarian way. We kidnap unhappy people with a, without a lot of friends and much family and stealing their organs and redistributing it, re redistributing those organs to save lives. And that- The mental that hospitals had, are just- <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that system had been in place for 50 years and all of a sudden some libertarian comes along and says, no, this is terrible, stop it, stop it tomorrow. And then we complain like, well, but, but how, like, how do we stop it tomorrow? All well, these we get organ donors. <laughs> All these people would die if we stopped the program. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a program that I think that we right now would reject implementing, right? We would say, no, we shouldn't steal random people's organs to save more lives. That sort of utilitarian decision is something we reject. So what is so different for the libertarian to come along and say, and we need to cut back a bunch of stuff we're already doing because it's kind mm -hmm. of based on the same logic. These organs are different than money, right? Like, I feel like there's a difference between um, killing people without their consent to steal their <laughs> organs versus just like trimming 10% off the top of their income. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like one thing that we also haven't touched, I'd like to throw in, somebody did discuss it in the, the lectures, um, was is the idea that like, you know, when you live in society, um, you can't produce things you're not producing things like on your little farm by yourself normally you're producing things in a company which has shareholders which has investment has capital has means of production it has other laborers working on it um and ultimately nobody could ever get even close to like rich without the rest of society being there right and you could not also like have people be even be rich at all like without a government um, I, I just think like you wouldn't really see that many new billionaires without government. Um, everyone would just be really poor, um, except for maybe like a few extremely wealthy people. Can so I ask? Really, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, and like we're you have to allow people. Like yeah, you can set is what allows wealth to build. Money. It's not clear to me that you can respond to the libertarian by pointing out at how terrible things would be <laughs> if we stopped it. Because the libertarian, I think the position should be, we don't care about consequences. It's wrong to be taking money. Yeah, because they're Kantian. So they would say like, damn I mean, the consequences. To be fair, we're going to look at- as long as, it's, as long as we're doing the moral yeah. thing, yep. who cares if everyone's miserable? I guess so, it, yeah. It is, it is very, it is very- just a, is very much attached to this sort of Kantian position of not caring about consequences. Um, we're we're going to look at later on a position by John Rawls, who is going to give the sort of liberal political justification. He's also basing it in, uh, I mean, the obvious way to base it, a, liber a liberal position is uh, by appealing to utilitarianism. Rawls is going to give another Kantian justification for a more liberal progressive redistribution. I mean, he's gonna give the counter to Nozick, which is also gonna be, so oddly enough, the sort of two big political philosophies both say they're doing the Kantian thing. One is libertarian and the other one is liberal and cares about redistribution. Let me ask you one before we end on one of the things at the end, he talks about conscription. So the draft and um, he talks about the fact that he thinks that Locke thinks that a government should be able to have a draft, a lottery to force people to war for the general defense against their will. And a sergeant in the military can order a draftee to certain death on the battlefield, but he can't take a penny out of his paycheck, right? Like there's a way in, it's a little weird to think that I can't steal 10 bucks out of this guy's pocket, but I can order to him to his death. What do we think about, like, I and, mean, and Locke's idea here is government is legitimate when it's defending the, 
you know, the group interests that we have to have a military to defend all of us. I can force people to fight to the death to defend all of us as long as I've picked who's doing it by like a lottery. And, but I can't steal for, like, I can't take, like the idea here is oddly, I mean, I think true of the libertarian, the libertarian would say, if we went to war to defend our country, I can have a lottery and force people into the military to defend the country and fight to the death and order them to do something that will certainly get them killed, but I can't tax them $10 to support NASA or support some like a public road. Uh, is that in any way odd or is that like sensible? I think it's counterintuitive, but I think it does have some merit. Like for the society to still exist, occasionally other societies will have issues and start wars with them. So for my society to exist, I have to pick out the people who can go fight in the war and say that's uh, able-bodied men between the ages of 20 and 24. Well, I have to tell them to go fight for the rest of society so that my society can still exist. Like the methods of even just having the society like survive and benefit other people, I couldn't have that if I didn't, if I wasn't able to properly defend myself. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think the, the libertarian argument is something like you have to, I mean, there is no, with, a military and a police force are just defending your property rights and your, I mean, there's just no way to not need them. Everybody yeah. needs them. Everyone's benefiting from them. There's no way not to have. Yeah. I it's mean, like, no. if I don't have a fence around my, if I don't mark what my things are, I don't, I can't, I can't own them. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, there is a question as to why the argument for libertarianism doesn't keep going and justify a complete anarchy. Like what, why, why, is the sort of reasoning that leads us to libertarianism not lead to the stronger position that all government is wrong and all, because the libertarian allows for taxes. They only allow for taxes for a police and a military and a legal system to sort out mm -hmm. issues of property rights. Uh, but can, can the libertarian even justify taxes? I mean, if you start adopting that frame of mind is that not a slippery slope to just complete anarchism where any form of taxation is wrong and you can't even support a military or a police force? Well, I don't see how you would have property rights in an anarchist system um, other than, I mean, it just seems like you kind of get to the point of like a non-aggression principle and like you can just kill anyone whenever they violate any of your property rights. And it just, it just starts to get kind of nonsensical, I think. Um, and I just also want to respond earlier. Um, I definitely think the idea that like a government can take your life, but not like a penny of your money. That also seems nonsensical to me. Really? I, re I, I, yeah. find, I find that so compelling. I think that like taking something unjustly, even if it's a penny is far like, like that's fine. Taking someone's life justly, like, Executing a murderer is fine, but stealing a penny from an innocent person is wrong. I mean, like, there's a yeah. the, the the difference between doing harm to someone that's justified and doing it unjustified is just such a big difference. Yeah, well, so why do you think it's unjustified? Totally justified. Yeah, what? I mean, I mean, that's that's the that's the rub of it, right? Like, is it is it justified mm -hmm. for the military? Like, it, yeah. I mean, do you I, think wars are justified, David? Like, do you like? Would you be um, a conscientious a conscientious objector? Do you think? Like, I'm the, I mean, it's difficult to say. Like, without knowing what the war is, I think Obviously. that I suspect that a lot of the wars that we're involved in um, aren't great. Um, I feel like um, there's definitely have been wars in the past that we should go fight in. Um, yeah. So you'd fight for the North in the Civil War. Or you'd probably fight for the Allies in uh -huh. World War II. Well, I mean, I don't know that I'd like personally want to. But you'd, su fight you'd for support. Them. Yeah, like I just feel like I would not want to sacrifice my life for an ideology, uh, no matter how compelling the ideology is. Uh, I feel I'd rather just keep living. So, so this so, is a little personal for me, but I'm actually kind of curious about both your opinions. So, let's, mm -hmm. I, I didn't fight in Afghanistan. I fought in Iraq. But first, I tend to think of Afghanistan as the good war where we were attacked and we responded. Do we feel okay about Afghanistan or no? I mean, I don't really know that much about the war to be honest, but I do 
I have heard some things that basically our fighting there isn't really solving much, that our response to attacks may have been justified, but that us being there isn't really going to give them a strong government. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know all too much about um, that war, but I suspect that I probably wouldn't support it if I knew everything. With, I mean, with Iraq, it was, I think, I mean, I went at the very beginning where the, the justification for the war was we're going to, I mean, A, we were just attacked and the idea was we have to start intervening and shutting things like we can't just ignore this stuff anymore because it's going to eventually come to our shores. Like, like we what a U.S. base was attacked, and that was mm -hmm. why. Like U.S. base was attacked. Or... Well, no, I mean, no, I mean, after Afghanistan attacking on 9/11, the idea okay. was we need to like proactively start uh, aggressively getting involved in a lot of places. Yeah, the war. So Iraq didn't attack us at all, and they weren't involved in 9/11, and they didn't support Al Qaeda. Uh, Saddam did seem like he was trying to produce weapons of mass destruction, which he was not. I was there. We did not find any. Uh, I can tell I was there for the first year of the war. We, we thought we were going to find some. We thought we were going to fight in chemical warfare environments, and it didn't happen. Uh, I think he was proactively trying to give the appearance that he had chemical weapons because he thought the U.S. wouldn't invade, and he wanted to intimidate Iran. So yeah, it's was, like, look strong when you're weak. Yeah, right? he was trying to yeah. look strong. And uh, I mean, I don't fucking no I, I think bush was a doofus and there was a lot of shitty people around him but in any case it seems like iraq might have been at best a mis an honest mistake at worst like a malicious intentionally bad war um which is unfortunate i think once we got there and overthrew saddam we might have been like continuing to fight there might have been trying to clean up our mistake and you could be justified in staying just to like try to fix things the best you can before you leave. But yeah, the Iraq war is, I feel progressively less good about that war as time goes on. And I feel bad, I, I wish I had fought in Afghanistan because that definitely seems like the more justified of the two wars. Um, but all right, I'm gonna end the talk of the Sandel stuff here because I think we've gone on but final thoughts on anything from the Sandel, anything from anything we've talked about or something we didn't talk about that you want to mention? Uh -huh. We didn't talk about the, um, the like the birth thing and like the, uh, can you withdraw consent? Like, could the mother make the contract? You know, I'm going to receive $10,000 um, to have a child for this person. And then I'm going to give it up. And then can you withdraw that later? Um, again, that's something that I really don't know the answer to. And that, that's the only opinion I have is I simply don't know. Um, what, when can you withdraw consent? I'm not sure. Oh, one thing I was confused about on that is they kept referring to the surrogate as it was her child. But I'm pretty sure her egg wasn't involved because isn't a surrogate the mother and father, they create an ovum from their egg and sperm, and then that is artificially implanted. So no part of the child was hers other than the fact that it was in her uterus. I'm not sure, but I think it can go both ways. Sometimes they do use her egg and sometimes they don't. Okay, because that I'm... part was confused. Like, I wasn't sure which one it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, one more thought, which is well, that- well, let me, David, on your point though, I think that issues of consent are just so incredibly difficult and important. And like, that's something that uh, I think philosophy and ethicists, I mean, we do work on, and I think that that's one of the most important, like sorting out those issues will often help us sort out a lot of really difficult, if we can figure and out a lot of harm, a, there's a lot of issues that depend on how we understand consent. And that seems like that's super important. Uh huh. Um, if I can say one more thing, which is that I, um, or you're going to have to cut this out. I need a, one moment to think of what it was again. Okay, Sophia, you. So, is there anything from this, th these lectures that you wanted to uh, return to or bring up that we didn't get a chance to talk to about? Um, not really, but I do have like a fun fact. So afterwards, I looked it. up maybe a nice palate cleanser. Is I looked up the requirements for egg donation and like what you could get for it, and it was basically like. I like I looked it up like for eggs it was like you needed like five months of a monitoring period because they like 
like removing an egg is a much more intense procedure. It was like, it was basically like you have to be healthy, have uh, three generations worth of medical history, not be a smoker. And that was about it, which I thought was kind of funny. I mean, you can make a lot of, there's a lot of money yeah. to be made there. It was $8,000 for one cycle. It was like, you can make up to 48,000. So if you think about it, that's like tuition money, you know? So <laughs> it was like, you have to be within two hours of one of their centers in case like stuff happens. Cause I'm pretty sure how it works is they, they kind of pump you full of estrogen and then they remove the extra eggs. So that, that doesn't sound fun, but. <laughs> David, did you think of the other thing you wanted to bring up? I did, yes. It was, it. Um, I just feel like um, in the, the the arguments that were being made, that the idea of coercion was brought up like way, way, way too often. Um, for me, what coercion means is like, to use the example of sex, um, it means that like somebody like asks, you know, do I have consent? Like, have sex? And the person says no. And then you like keep pressing them on it. You're like, but I really want to and so on. It, it means like you're not respecting their decision and you're trying to like manipulate them into changing their mind. Uh, for me, that's what coercion means. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a good definition of coercion. Yeah. My, my go-to example is always you, you get someone on your boat, you take them out into the middle of the ocean and then you put a gun to your, their head and say, either get off my boat or pull out your cell phone and transfer. I mean, I've given you a choice, get off my boat or stay on my boat, but it's coerced. Yeah, but I think- It's like live I, or I think, die. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's too simplistic of an example. I think that your your proposed criteria is a nice one, which is, are you, are is the other person trying to bypass your, like your decision? Are we trying to manipulate, am I in trying to pressure you in any way other than giving you good reasons to change your mind, mm -hmm. uh, trying to bypass your rational abilities and pressure you? That that seems like a, I mean, to, to, to define coercion by talking about the intent of the coercer rather than the environment, or that seems like a good, I mean, there are people who work on this and they have, and there are debates about probably 10 different accounts of coercion, but I'm sure one of them is what what the intent of the coercer is, but mm -hmm. you know, I interrupted. Yeah, the, the two things that like came, that come up often, or well, one of them that comes up a lot is like sex work. You know, can you pay, like if you pay somebody um, to have sex with, is that coercion? I think it's ridiculous to think it is. It's and obviously then, not in many cases, but there's the, 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 the industry, maybe because it's illegal and under, you know, under the radar has a lot of co So Yeah, I've heard explanations I mean that it's like, you have no other options in life. So in that way, you're coerced into this industry. I mean, that's, that's, not always, that's not always true, right? There's plenty of people who engage in sex work freely of their own choice. Yes, but, 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 like, but, I, but I think that the worry is that just the industry has so many people who are coerced into it is the worry. Mm -hmm. Continue I, mean, I, can, I can definitely see that worry. Um, then the second thing was like that was brought up in this series was the idea of um, the civil war and can you pay someone to take your place? Um, and everyone didn't like it. And the, the primary reason was they're saying, if you pay somebody, you're coercing them to go. But I don't think so. Like, you're not like, no. like, you know, you're just paying them money. They know the terms, right? I think that there is a good reason to at least see something fishy about this system. Um, but I think the only reason why there could be anything fishy about this system is just because of how blatantly like different, it, it affects different classes, right? Like depending on how rich you are, um, getting drafted in that system could be like a death sentence or it could mean it's just like a small fine, right? I just feel like that very different impact that it has is the only reason why we shouldn't support that system. But otherwise, I think that to say that they're being coerced because they're being paid, I think that's silly. Yeah, one thing there I is noticed about that audience is that they seemed very hesitant to like bite the bullet is the term we use in terms of putting value on human life and human services. Like even surrogacy, I feel like they were like, oh, you can't put a price on it. But like, I agree with you. It's like, you made a contract, you drew up the terms, unless the person was like mentally incapable of understanding the terms of service. But yeah, I think David, I think what it's boiling down to is how we were saying earlier that Locke was throwing around, um, no, I'm sorry, the libertarians were throwing around equating slavery with these things when you thought it should be more like robbery. 
I think they're kind of doing the same thing with coercion, like they're overusing the term, which is. Is this, is this a product kind of, of like rich Harvard kids who like, are, it's easy for them to like say, well, that is totally off the table. That is just completely dehumanizing. Whereas people mm -hmm. who are poorer are like more willing to like see that as yeah. just like another part Maybe. of life. Maybe like, you have to like work a job where you're like where you're treated like shit and like that's something we're used to and that just seems <laughs> I mean, a part and of maybe life. they're right. Maybe when you have uh, more influence and opportunities, maybe you really see how bad the coercion is, and we're just kind of like, oh, whatever. I mean, it's just part of everyday life. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, that that may be true. Um, but Sophia, I totally agree with you one hundred percent. They seem extremely unwilling to say that like you could have a price on life, but like. I mean, if somebody, you can, if you like, pay somebody to go to the war for you and they say, this is the amount of money I'm willing to accept, and then maybe mm -hmm. you can reasonably expect there's like a 30% chance they die, they've set a price on their own life, right? Yeah, I mean, or even <laughs> like- It just is. Or like you could even say, I paid $100 for this person's egg. I paid $1,000 for sperm, processes, medical bills. This baby cost like 20 grand. Like you could literally- put that price on a person on like how much it costs to like create them or something. Like we do the same thing with cattle and like prize racehorses. I don't think there's that big of a difference for humans. Well, I think, I mean, we treat the idea, one of the, I think fundamental things of maybe not for the utilitarian, but at least for Kantians and maybe, ver I mean, that, that personhood is this special different thing that humans possess, maybe higher order monkey apes, possess, I mean, that, the, the, I mean, yeah, when you we say like we, to think we're special. I, I mean, I, all right, I'm a Kantian. I think we are special. I don't think that there are, I think that there are other things that are special. I think the great apes are, I, I think there's, pro, I absolutely think that there are aliens somewhere in the universe who are just as smart as us, you know, uh, but I, I don't think that cows are the same as us, um, but I thought you were a vegetarian. I am a videos about the crying cows. I don't. I don't have a good justification for my utilitarianism, or sorry, my 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 vegetarianism, other than the fact that I, I just have to believe that something makes suffering wrong. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'd be, I'm, I I don't have a good justification for it, other than uh, I, I'm ha I'm a Dan Moeller. I'm yeah. a I'm a, a moral risk. Like this seems like maybe I'm wrong, but this definitely seems kind of not right yeah <laughs> something definitely seems very wrong about it just like instinctually um okay great i'm gonna end this and uh thanks for showing up and i'll i'll post this for my online only students okay awesome